LL Nation, what's good? Glad to catch you on an evening instead of a morning. That's Thank right. You. That's right. The original Lucky Lefty is back in the building. This is the Lucky Lefty podcast. I'm Sean Davis at SD2 Mics. The original Lucky Lefty himself, Malik Zaire at Overtime Malik. As always, we are featuring and brought to you by Anora Whiskey. Go to anorawhiskey.com, that premium American whiskey. That's right, anorawhiskey.com. Look, I see the comments. We're about to get to it. We're going to dive right into it. I want you all to understand that, as always, we are a very authentic podcast. We're going to keep it a buck, one thou. And uh, some topics we got to get to tonight. Mike Elston steps away and goes back to his alma mater, leaves Notre Dame. Uh, I can honestly say I give all credit for this story. I don't care who posted it first. Uh, I got Brian Driscoll had this story. Brian Driscoll. He had, it direct, he had it direct from the horse's mouth first, days ago. And in hell, hey, I held on to it. You know what I'm saying? And uh, well, the first time I talked to you about it was today. And i like to say this. First of all, thank you, Mike Elson, for all the work that you put in. But this reminds me of the time that Greg Madison was a longtime D-line coach at Notre Dame, top recruiter at Notre Dame. And, um, yo, when he left, the fan base pretty much felt the same way they're feeling tonight. And I understand that you know, Mike Elson is a tremendous loss, and he's done a lot of work, but we're going to be all right. Like, we're going to be all right. Let me let me insert Kendrick Lamar right there. We're going to be all right, you know? And we're going to get into some things, but number one, I would like to say that for me, I wish Mike Elston, because it's tricky, right? Marcus Freeman becomes the head coach, but he has to accept um, Tommy Reese, and he has to accept Mike Elston. Jack Swarbrick goes out, solidifies them. You can't blame Jack Swarbrick because the way everything was going down, the way Brian Kelly was leaving, he was trying to, like, leave everything just bare. And Jack yeah. Swarbrick was trying to, like, save the ship from going down. Really, and save the brand at that time and stabilize it until they found the next head coach. So that's not the issue. Um, Mike Elston, at some point, I guess, felt like this was his best opportunity to take the next step and become the def defensive coordinator. Uh, he got that audition. I don't blame Mike Elston for the Fiesta Bowl. I don't know about you, bro. I don't blame Mike Elston for the Fiesta Bowl. And, and I just don't. Was it the best performance by a coordinator? I wouldn't sit up here and lie to the fan base. I wouldn't say what, that. What don't you? What don't you blame on him? No, I don't blame him for the Fiesta Bowl. And you know me. Every time people start talking about coaching in the Fiesta Bowl, I go right to this. He prepared us really well. He had us ready for the high tempo. He had us ready. Like it wasn't ready. schematically. It was a little the little details of we missed tackles. We didn't win the 50-50 balls. Those little details, and we need to make sure we do that better. And it's on us. And going into the next season, I just want to make sure I focus on the fundamentals, the little things like finishing leverage tackles, not going one for one for blocks, just every little detail, just being able to enhance it. And then just being able to take that next step in leadership and be able to help this team become the team that we want to become. That's it. I don't, yeah. blame, I don't blame Marcus Freeman. I don't blame Mike Elston. Look, man, you can prepare all you want to. You can prepare all you want to. You can tell them to your blue in the face. When you see this, look for this. Break down. Use your fundamentals. Make the tackles. Some kids just aren't good enough. All right? Wait a minute. You see how well gorgeous linebackers approached the tackle with speed and broke down properly and wrapped up? Did you see that? That was, that was an NFL defense. So. Okay, but see, wait a minute. 
So basically, you're telling me that Notre Dame linebackers can't have fundamentals. This, I'm, sure, two, I'm sure they were two talk. different two different type of linebackers in that situation. And I'm sure the defensive line was taught all season long. When you're facing a running quarterback, you cannot rush beyond him, especially at the defensive tackles, right? What did they do against Sam Howe? Same thing. What did they do against Spencer Sanders? Same thing. I guarantee you Mike Elson preached till he was blue in the face. We have to keep this guy in the pocket. We cannot rush past him and give him a seam up the middle. And what did they do the entire second half? That's what they did. So, yeah, you want to come up with, say, it was scheme, this, that, and the other. Notre Dame had two chances to win the game on the offensive side of the ball, period, period. And this is, wait a minute, you didn't, you, I, you didn't have a chance. Yesterday, the most amazing thing to me from post game when Kirby Smart and Nick Saban met in the middle of the field, they mic'd up their conversation, and Nick Saban told Kirk, Kirby Smart, you kicked our ass in the fourth quarter. Because that's two programs that know what it's all about. It's not about the first, second, third quarter. This is going to come down to the fourth quarter and who can make the plays. Yeah. And they both knew that. And Nick Saban said, you kicked our ass in the fourth quarter. That's why you won the game. And so if Notre Dame's going to take that next step. Coaching all of that fundamentals, that happens. Just to think. That these coaches are just rolling out the balls every day and just watching these guys go through practice. Look, man, at some point, accountability has to fall on the guys that go in between the sidelines and make things happen for 75 to 80 plays every week. Every week. So for Notre Dame fans out there that are on the side of good riddance, he was horrible in the Fiesta Bowl, Relax. For those that are wanting to light candles and have a visual for the loss of Mike Elston, like, oh, my God, what are we going to do? Relax. Relax. There are other great defensive line coaches out there. On Irish Breakdown, you can go to the message board. I spoke to several NFL scouts and NFL coaches trying to get recommendations for great defensive line coaches in the college ranks. And they gave me two names popped up. And I put both of those names on the Irish Breakdown message board. All right. One is the D-line coach at Iowa. And the other one is the D-line coach at Memphis. Studs. I talked to about five NFL scouts or NFL coaches that have knowledge of what's going on. Kelvin Bell from Iowa. And you got Marcus, uh, Kyle Pope from Memphis. Marcus West also came up from UTSA because UTSA has been leading the nation in sacks over the last two years. People don't know that. Yeah, and they got uh, and they got the guy in New Orleans. Yes, that was a draft picked out of UTSA at the end. Yeah. But, so um, look, people can do the job. And I know we, we felt like we would never see another great D-line coach when Greg Madison left. You're feeling the same way about this guy. Give him his flowers. He did a great job. Let's go get the next great D-line coach in Notre Dame. That's it. Yeah, yeah. the one thing you know about Notre Dame is that our coaches are definitely through revolving doors. Yeah, I think Coach Elson has been the longest, the last standing guy or the the guy that Coach Kelly's held on to the most and even went through a demotion from defensive assistant back to D-line coach. So Coach Elson is probably one of BK's most loyal um, loyal coaches on the staff, which, you know, it has, its, it has its place. You know, Coach Elson has racked up a ton of NFL prospects on his roster that he can, like, relate to, and, and, and he's been a great recruiter. He was my personal recruiter for my area. So, I, you know, I was the first coach I really got to know really well was Coach Elson. And so, for me, it just really turned into, uh, you know, it's, he's moving on to a better position. I understand his position on the transition of things. I think he really uh, wanted a chance to um, – I think he really wanted a chance to get that D coordinator spot. And yeah, I understand. Part of me understands and part of me doesn't understand. Like, I get both sides. Part of me is like, look, man. 
yo, the story broke that you actually took a plane ride down to Baton Rouge. Yeah. To talk to Brian Kelly. Then you came yeah. back and told Jack Swarbrick you wanted to stay. Once you came back, you should have been all in. It shouldn't have been based upon whether or not you were going to get the, D the defensive coordinator position. Yeah. Yeah. At that yeah. point, yeah. you're committing to Marcus Freeman and Notre Dame. Now, that's the way I feel. Maybe everybody else sees it different. I'm not telling the man what's the best for him, what's the best for his family. That's not my job. I'm just looking from the outside in. You had the opportunity to decide what was best for your family when you were down there talking to Brian Kelly. I don't know what transpired in that conversation, but once you came back to Notre Dame and told Jack Swarbrick you were staying, guess what? That should have been a commitment, regardless of whether or not you got the job. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think he went down there looking for that that opportunity with Coach Kelly. He's probably one of those like, hey, you know, new 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 spot, new you, new me. You right. know, I think he was trying to tag along. And Coach Kelly being the G he is, he's like, I don't really want you down here, Elson. You, you know, you can be a assistant again, but I ain't got no D coordinator. And I think you hurt him even worse, him actually making Cooks the D coordinator. Which you know is probably some as a DB being a defensive coordinator over a guy that's been your right hand man. Yeah. You know, I think he's been striking out a lot on that end. So, you know, him leaving is probably a fresh start. He probably wants. I think he's just, just as Coach Kelly got tired of the, uh, you know, just the messaging. You know, you've been there in one spot; it hasn't taken off how you wanted to. And so, you know, it's it's good for him, and I think it's a chance for us to get somebody even better. Yeah. You know, I think all these places, uh, all these things we have to fill are places that are desired positions. You know, we can get a good D-line coach that wants to come in and coach at Notre Dame. Oh, yeah. And more, more importantly, you know, more people that are not on Marcus Freeman's team and supporting what he's trying to do, the better. So if you're taking trips down there as soon as your guy gets fired, we know you're not really on the side of supporting Marcus Freeman as what he needs you know, in these beginning years. So, you know, I think this is an opportunity for him to hire his people, you know, get his guys in there, get guys like uh, Brian Hartline, hopefully, and get guys like Leonidas just to surround yourself with guys you know are not going to take plane rides and go take secret meetings or whatever the case may be, at least in the beginning. So um, if anything, you know, I have four offensive coordinators and quarterback coaches in my three, four years being there. So I'm used to the revolving door at Notre Dame, and usually they don't hit too many bump in the roads uh, in transition in that aspect. Yeah, Lucky Lucky podcast discussing the departure of Mike Elson, uh, leaving the opening at the defensive line coach. Huge void, just be honest. He was a great recruiter. Um, he's contacted guys he recruited in the 23 class, that great defensive class. That Notre Dame is stacked up. I'm pretty sure with Ohio being one of his territories, that Brennan Vernon was one of the uh, guys he contacted. And uh, yo, Notre Dame is going to have to put in work now. Marcus Freeman is going to have to put in work not only to solidify the position, but to hold on to the great class he had uh, garnered up to this point with the departure of one Mike Elston. So, yeah, I actually don't think that the the recruiting is be impacted as much. You know, I haven't heard too many people, uh, even though Coach Elson's a fantastic recruiter, necessarily the, the players that he recruited leaving because he's leaving, like a Lincoln Riley situation. So I do think it, it won't impact the 2023 class as much, especially that linebacking core, because I really believe Marcus Freeman has a very big hand within the retention of that class, and I think they want to play for Marcus Freeman, which is which is credit to why he's the head coach. You know, you have an attractive piece that's going to bring people to want to be around him. And, you know, I think even with that recruiting piece, him bringing more attractive pieces like the Derek Mason possibly, I think Tyler Stockton would be great if you bring it in, people that are understand what it means to be a Notre Dame lineman. And, you know, he's, he's been working his way for a long time. So it's just an opportunity to do a lot of different uh moves for Coach Freeman, but it's also great because we've been talking about, for instance, the Fiesta Bowl. Yeah. We're closing the chapter on that because that mainly wasn't his team. 
So going into this first year and getting to go going against Ohio State, we can evaluate him properly now that he's made the proper hires. You know, I still think that offensive side of football has got to be looked at at some point before the Ohio State game, either buffering that situation or, you know, getting some more behind it. But still, he's doing a great job for what he's given, and I don't think it's as bad as the reports keep coming out here and there. So let's get to a couple of super chats. Uh, Sean, please get this John Gall troll off the chat. Deuce Canoe. I I saw him. I didn't get a chance to really read what he was saying, but just for my LL Nation, I got him up out of there. You know what? I think pretty much we said everything we need to say about Mike Elston. It's really yeah. not even a um, – He's a great man, uh, very well respected by the players. Long legacy with guys that are in the NFL that still love him, love what he meant to them, what he did for their lives on and off the field. So, you know, Notre Dame lost a lot today. He lost a, a great man, a great coach, a great recruiter. And the program, I mean, he's going to be missed. But like I said, we're going to be all right. We're going to be all right. We got Harry Heastan. That's a big anchor on the team. I think we'll be good in that side of the trench. If we get a killer D-line coach, I think it'll just, you know, it'll change the narrative on that side of football as well. Yeah. Kirk D.A. Anderson Fitness, thank you for your super chat. We appreciate you. Um. <laughs> Man, we got some nominations for the Petty Train. I see you, Ty B. We'll <laughs> get to it. Uh, Drunk Vigo, one of our day one, says, Malik, I can't handle this, bro. No, I mean, it's good. I you know. a Nor for the pain. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> but, I mean, I think it's good. You know, anytime you're going through a big transition, I think it's a worse feeling 2016 going to 2017 when you're losing your strength coach. You're losing the whole staff. That's that would be a dumpster fire uh, situation. I think losing the D line coach has been there forever. You know, yeah. it's it's not like the D line has been the strength of our team at at any certain point. You know, so I think it can have room for improvement, which is what the fans should want. And I think it's a great opportunity, if anything, to expand on what we talk about the culture at Notre Dame, and if we can get the culture of at Notre Dame or D line, a gritty, aggressive Alabama, you know, that Alabama Georgia D line was something special to watch. Yeah. You know, and that's just, I mean, you're talking about guys that were penetrating, creating sacks, being disruptive. And these are two great teams, you know, on both sides, on both sides. So, and it was yeah, one of those games where where like that. You realize early on, both teams tried to scheme against the others D line. And when they realized that the D line was just too good, they were just too good. They were blowing everything up. Yeah, they, everybody time. was blowing stuff up. And, and, and then you realize, you know what? This is just going to be a mono a mono game. Yeah. And whoever wears each other, man, whoever's worn down in the fourth. I mean, duking it out, duking it out, duking it out. So heavyweight fight. That's that's the type of physicality we would want to see from our D line. Yeah, I mean, and, it, and, the, and the, the jump it would take to get there is a big gap. Yeah, I think that we had a good D line, yeah, but the 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 size, speed, physicality, and disruptiveness that was those two D lines. I think it's the main reason why we see those two teams in the finals most of the time at the end of the year, and and why we have that jump that we need to make where it is. You know, this is one of the greatest names I've ever seen. Thank you for the super chat, Charlie Weiss, last belt loop. That's funny. Appreciate you. I have faith in Coach Freeman and what he does. That's yeah, when you're from Dayton and you bring in that Ohio State flavor of some, you know, consistency and some, some of that little sprinkle on top, just have a little faith, man. Just give us some time. Once again, super chat from Kurt D.A. Anderson Fitness in the NBA class of 2006. I'm not here. Great show and channel. Keep up the good work. Go Irish. We appreciate you, Kirk. 
Thank you so much. Thank you to LL Nation. Don't forget, subscribe, share, like, hit the like button. Hit the like button. Uh, let's get some more of your comments about Elston. How are you guys feeling about Mike Elston leaving Notre Dame and going to his alma mater, Michigan? Matt D says, thank you for the super chat. Thanks for running a great show. We appreciate you. Thank you, Matt D. Any uh, closing thoughts about Elston? Is there anything that sticks out from your time that you spent with him as a player? Like one story that you're like, man, this is what I'll remember the most about him. <laughs> man, he always did that for his guys. So Stefan to it. Uh, I was a freshman or early enrollee, and I had class with to it. And I remember because I had the first day, you know, they were real big on going to study hall and doing all these things. After the first day, I haven't saw two since. You know, I'm thinking, oh, man, you know, whatever. And he showed up on the last day of class. And I just, and I'm like, how did how did this even happen? And he was like, you know, uh, you know, Elson looked out, you know, and I just knew then if anybody had somebody's back on the team, you know, Elson had his D-line group back because he's supposed to have a lot of hours in study hall and in that class he's supposed to miss. Somehow he passed it. I don't know. But, you know, Elston definitely – uh, good guy, man. He looked out for his line, and he recruited me. You know, he was my first recruiter at Notre Dame. A uh, genuine guy came up to the school a couple times. So um, uh, his wife's really good, he's real supportive. So I know she's uh, she was probably more disappointed that he didn't get it than he was because I know she's a, yeah. she's been there, and he's got a house full of daughters. So I know they're looking for him to be taking those big steps. So I know he's going to do a good job going back to his alma mater, hopefully, and We'll see what happens. Yeah, that D-line minus those two defensive ends is going to be a little suspect this year. So I hope he knows he left uh, <laughs> a better situation. But, hey, thank you for the super chat, Anthony Soblin. I hope all is well with you and your family, Malik. The fans worried about you, bro. They were like, wait, wait, where's Malik at? No, we here, man. We here, live and prime. Let's see. He dub says he did his thing here, absolutely, and it was time for him to go. Hey, you that's know, how you sum it up. That's how you sum, you it, sum up. it up. Yeah, you run your course. No sense in waiting around, and I would much rather have him off the staff than to have him on the staff feeling a certain type of way. You know what I mean? Need any, uh, no ship sinkers. No, no ship no. sinkers on this MF era. Let's see, Sean S. Um uh, way off topic, second time I've asked. I'm sorry, Sean S. Malik has one of the strongest indie arms in the past decades. <laughs> How far can the man throw it? Most definitely. I definitely have the longest in the game, I think, in the air distance for the one with Will Fuller, but I definitely had a nice little cannon on me, man. I think I could throw like 70 yards at the time. But you know, a left hander can always uh throw it, man, till I'm 70. So he was getting that boomer science and all, dude. Oh, uh, you already know. I don't know. <laughs> boomer be hating on too much. I don't know. He be hating on, on quarterbacks too much. I can't can't rock with boomer science, man. Yeah, lucky lefty podcast. Uh, Chancey Stucky. Chancey, Chancey Stucky. Stucky. NFL vet, four years. Canadian Football League, one year. Georgia. State player of the year coming out as a senior. Went to the University of Clemson over the likes of Georgia, Georgia Tech, Alabama. Big time recruit. Go to Clemson. Very productive wide receiver. Great with the ball after. Great rat guy. Catch the ball, make moves, make you miss, getting yards after the catch. Down at Baylor this last year, started off working with receivers like T. Higgins and those guys at Clemson. So the pedigree is there, and I'm liking this. I mean, I understand. We'll get to um, why most of uh, Indy Nation's, uh, Notre Dame's fans, and LL Nation, the IB Nation, why the guy they wanted, Jamarcus Shepard, we'll get to why he ended up at uh, ultimately at Washington. But – uh, Chancey Stucky comes in. He's a new wide receiver coach. And he's a coffee dude. That's the one thing. So, like, LL Nation, be nice 
we need your best recommendations for coffee because he's a coffee fiend his favorite mm -hmm. coffee his favorite type of coffee coffee is ethiopian coffee i don't know if they can find that oh hell South Bend, uh, I'm, South to, Bend. I'm gonna have to get that uh that shipment rolling in right well we need the best coffee shops in south bend because that's what chancy stucky likes he likes three cups a day he likes to go from hot and end the day with cold that's what he says he likes to start off with hot and end the day up with the uh cold coffee hopefully so, his coaching isn't like that you know we can get some, <laughs> some stay consistently hot throughout the whole time you know we don't want right. to lean off of that at all right so coming in i liken this to have you ever woke up on Christmas and you didn't get everything on the list. It's tough days. It's a tough holiday. Yeah, you know, but you're a kid, right? So ultimately you should be grateful. So you remember the year that the Genesis Sega Genesis came out? Like mm. you moved from Nintendo and the Sega Genesis came out and they had Madden. So I'll never forget my dad first of all had to drive all the way out to the suburbs of chicago to find a sega genesis that was left in stock right because mm -hmm. they were gone all over the chicagoland area games were sold out so when we opened the sega genesis we're like yeah we had given them a list of probably like five games to grab with the sega genesis we opened the sega genesis and we only had one game to play he bought us one game and we were upset so he took the game and put it in his room because we were mad and we didn't get it back for a week and he was like yo i gotta teach you a lesson about being grateful mm. all right because what you want might, ne might not necessarily always be what you get but be thankful the fact that you got the system yeah. at least you got the system at least i drove 40 miles out to schomburg to make sure you at least got the system and it, it's not that I didn't want to get you the games. They just didn't have. So when they get the games back in stock, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to get the games for you. Be patient. Yeah. Wait. Yeah, be patient. And that's the way we feel, right? Because we wanted either Holman Wiggins or Jamarcus Shepard. They were the big names. And all of a sudden, Chan, we hear about Jamarcus Shepard taking a job in Washington as co-office and coordinator. Now, He's co-offensive coordinator at Washington and wide receivers coach. He wasn't going to get that at Notre Dame. He wasn't getting that for obvious reasons. And we'll get to that down the line. We'll talk about that in a little bit. He wasn't definitely getting wasn't getting that. No, he, he wasn't getting that at Notre Dame. So, you know, Notre Dame fans opened the package today and they're like, yo, this is not what we – this is not what we asked for. This is not what we are being sold for a couple of weeks. And it's cool. But once again, the tone setter for this coaching staff is Marcus Freeman in recruiting and everything else. So you have to trust that whomever he tabs or picks fits and knows what's expected of them. So it might not be everything we want, but when you really look at the resume, Yo, darn good player. Digs in the South, well respected in the South, especially in the state of Georgia. Well respected in the state of Texas, was able to pull multiple four stars and five stars from schools like Texas AM. He flipped a kid from Texas AM last year. Like, yo, this guy, he, he has the digs, he has the wares, he can get it done. And the coaches in Texas and Georgia and in the South know it. Not just as a coach, but as one of the best players that ever come out of the South. So, with all of that being said, you have to feel good that you got what you got. It might not be the full system with the five games, but you got the system, and maybe you just wait and you be patient to see what else is coming down the road when we see how he produces or develops these wide receivers and ultimately recruits the offensive side of the ball in the 2023 class. Yeah, absolutely. This is just one of those games where you can you can spend a lot of hours playing it, and it, it can feel like a long time where you pass the time until you get the new game. Yeah. I do think that this is a great hire from a, 
a resume standpoint to attract uh, higher quality five star type receivers. I think he had, can point to a resume and be like, I was at Clemson. I did some things at Baylor. I got, you know, T. Higgins, guys like that. I do believe him being able to play well instantly or being able to play and had a high level of playing will instantly improve that receiver room from a technique standpoint because I doubt that he would not at least have participated in some of those drills where he can learn something from them. He's going to teach him some things that maybe a coach that hasn't played as high level will be able to teach. And he's probably the, the most relatable coach we've we've had at receiver coach in a while. I mean, we even had Denbrock at receiver coach, and he's probably the least receiver ability coach <laughs> possible that we've had outside of Brian Kelly. Yeah. So I think this is the closest likeness to what a Marcus Freeman is to a linebacker that this is to a receiver, which is – a strong position to have that in because the relatability in this day and age with the style of how receivers are, especially in recruiting, I think he'll be fun to talk to on the phone, uh, somebody that'd be great on the road. So um, he meets the part that we need and probably was lacking um, in that area. The other area is, is he going to be able to uh, – Give these things to his, his receiver room under what Tommy wants to run, and is he going to be able to mix his style uh, the right way with what Tommy's doing? Because ultimately, you know, that's as we've seen, and which we'll talk about later, how Tommy's been kind of operating. It's kind of top down and yeah. uh, get in where you fit in kind of thing. So uh, I think it's important that, yeah, he has a great resume coming in, but is he going to be able to express that in that room? Another super chat from my guy, day one, Matt Anderson. John Haycock from Iowa State seems like a good fit for D.C. Anybody know about their D-line coach and if he would come with and also if he can recruit? That's one of, from what I've been told, that's one of the holdups with Haycock coming to Notre Dame is he wants to bring a bunch of guys with which would displace some guys, especially the secondary coaches, and uh, Marcus Freeman is not having that. It's kind of a situation like this is the defensive coordinator position. We already have our defensive positional coaches set. You come on in, you know, and if he wants, that's it. See, if John, if Haycock wants to stay with his guys, I understand. Yeah, stay with you guys and be loyal, tip of the cap. We go on we to really, the we really like the Lakers when it comes to signing people and having people come on board because it's an expectation at Notre Dame that you know you're going to be in the spotlight, you're going to be called upon more than you you can't fly under the radar. You know you can no. fly under the radar, at Iowa State. Uh, you may do well at another program like Iowa State and then falter just because of the you know the 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 amount of prestige it is to even be. Uh, in the defense coordinator. Now, we've been great. You know, we've been actually really good in our last defensive coordinator efforts, being able to produce superstars like Clark Lee and Mike Elko and uh, have a running scheme of that. So that's even some pressure to follow up. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's just an interesting hire because it has to be the right hire, uh, especially if you don't want to lose momentum that we've been building for so long defensively. I mean, if anything, the defense through these 12 years has kept us the closest to the playoffs than even what the offensive sputters have been, you know. Yeah, just to follow up on that, Matt Anderson said, so ND reached out to him and was turned down. No. He interviewed, the job was pretty much his, and he made a request that Notre Dame fire positional coaches and he bring his own in to Notre Dame rebuff that like that's not happening so that's kind of hard crazy. he tried to pull a power move and didn't have leverage you know what he i mean didn't, like didn't have leverage he tried to take over corners and he had he didn't have the muscle like it, it, you know that's a lot of muscle at notre dame it'd be you know? different if he was like a defensive coordinator coming from like Georgia somewhere. It's like, bro, you don't do. You have no Iowa State. 
Iowa State. We just watched what's the kid that decommitted the running back at Clemson. Uh, Will, uh, Will, uh, I know uh, number one, yes, number one. That's the dude, he just lit you up in the bowl game. Just lit you, you know up. what's crazy if he brought his whole staff over here, we wouldn't be Notre Dame anymore. No, mm -hmm. they, they probably have some really good coaches, you know, they probably have some good coaches. Haycock's a good coach, but it's like, you know, <laughs> when you make that type of move, that's kind of like. I remember the story of back in the day when people were just like giving up big money in the music industry. And I think it was uh, Irv Gotti told his story. He said he was with Jay-Z in the studio one day and uh, this movie studio kept calling for a theme song to this movie they were doing called Blue Street. And Jay didn't want to do it. So he kept ignoring the call, ignoring the call. So they kept calling and finally he picked up the phone and was like, 750,000 and hung up the phone. He just gave him an obscene amount of money that it would take to get him to do the song. And they called back 10 minutes later and said, okay, we got the check. You know what I'm saying? Jay just, he really didn't want to come, so he just threw out a number. That's how I feel. I feel like Haycock really didn't want to come after interviewing and was like, man, let me just make a crazy request that I, so I can't say no. Yeah, that I know more than likely they're not going to say yes to. It do. It felt like it feels the same way to me. Like, yeah, it's definitely crazy. something he tried to get off. You know, he, he probably was like, you know, it's not as appealing to what I got comfortable over here. Right. But if I can bring home over there, then I would make a flip. But he was swinging for something that I don't think he saw in the, in the cage. Yeah, for those first timers, man, tap in with us. When we say that, let us know where you're from. We want to acknowledge where you're from. This is your, if this is your first time tapping in with the yeah. podcast, let us know where you're from. I see Calumet City out there. Appreciate you, Troy. Tap yes, sir. In Calumet City. Uh, Joseph Dobzinski, thoughts on either of the OSU assistants for the DC, um, Oklahoma State or Ohio State? Yeah. Like, specify. Yeah. Specify. Ohio State just hired a brand new safety coach and another defensive coach today. So I don't know if you're talking about them. The Oklahoma People State coaches, moves now. Oklahoma State coaches? Heck no. Sorry. Not interested. <laughs> yeah, keep it. Keep it. Yes, I see uh, there were – Alabama, I believe, has seven guys in the portal, and I believe Georgia has, I think, three defensive backs in the portal. Uh, Amari Speed is one of those guys that Notre Dame might be interested in, because if I'm not mistaken, I think he's the one that is going to graduate. So maybe we did get a grad transfer at kicker. He's a little guy, too. Yeah. He's a little guy. Matter of fact, I saw on Twitter that he missed a 33 yarder to seal a game and, and they ended up losing in overtime this year. So that when I saw that, I was like, oh, come on, man. Hmm. Not a 33 yarder. But we'll see. Yeah, I mean, shoot. We're skimming off some of the top talent would always be good to look at, but. You know, it just it just got to be a fit. It just got to be a fit. Right. Clyde Terry, we appreciate you. Out in L.A. That's out in your Hey, we down the street. <laughs> that 2000 GT. Carmel, LaPorte, Indiana. Mike Hoff. What's up, my dude? What's up, what's up, what's up? Uh, Gavin Wright said, Chancey did get Baylor's highest recruiting years for what is worth. Yeah, that's, that's what I heard. He came in putting in work. Um... And the system they ran, honestly, the system they ran with their quarterbacks, which was heavy RPO, I think they were they referred to it as RVO instead of RPO. And uh, Bohannon is very similar to him, Tyler Butler, like very similar. So if you look at Bohannon and his game and how we think Tommy Reeves is going to develop Tyler Butler, probably very similar. 
very similar teachings, route combinations and concepts. I just want – look, I want to see us getting off bump and run in the spring game. If I see that, he's worth his weight and gold. Yeah, if he can if he can beat man and, and teach those receivers some how to stack and do some different things in and out of breaks, no doubt. That's that's all we really asking for in year one. Year yeah. two, I would say, okay, second down, let's throw the ball. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I want to get to. Second down, we throw it. You know, and had a confidence in Tyler. But right now, us doing a bunch of RPO stuff is, I think, is more up Tyler's alley, but I just think that's more gimmick in the long run. Uh, well, he's not, yo, he's not about to come out looking like C.J. Stroud and Bryce Young. Like we're fooling ourselves if that's what we think. Yes, we lost Malik. Lucky Lefty Podcast. I'm sure he'll be jumping right back in. Uh, but, yeah, as far as Bohannon, the offense, the concepts, everything they ran at Baylor, looks like it's going to be very similar to what he's going to be able to run and what the development of Tyler Buckner eventually will be. Uh, you want to yeah. finish that comment? Yeah, and Tyler Buckner, I just think that he's he has to be more of a, a ground-up, foundation i think if you get him cooking early with the some of the rvo or rpo stuff that hopefully they get into mm -hmm. that'll help him on some being a third and manageable i don't think he's going to be great especially in the first ohio state game being in third and long situations right so with with chancey stuckey's biggest jump is how can we get third and manageable for easy completions easy reads for Tyler to stay in it and then allow his talent to make some explosive plays later. But if we get stuck in 39, I just don't think that's where you say coming out throwing like Jack Cohn, 68 passes. I don't think that's where they want to live. Right. We see Jerome Vigo. Thank you for tagging in from uh, Canada. Ron Vickerstaff from Charlotte. That's what's up. Charlotte is a beautiful Charlotte stand city. Charlotte, stand up. That's a beautiful city, man. Crazy boy from the N.O., Coming in from all over, baby. All right, Bobby V. Checking in from Newport News, a.k.a. Bad News, Virginia. Down there in the Vic Territory. That's right. Yes, sir. Ashley Hill. Five, seven. Our sis, South Bend. He say. He say. <laughs> we got Granger, Indiana in the place. I got Sean Palace. Granger. Yes, sir. Granger Danger. John Nestler, Canton GA. What? Canton GA. All right. How far is that from Atlanta, John? Needs to know. Needs Canton to know. GA. We got Brandon Bradford down in Shreveport. Oh, yeah. That's right. Keeping Shout it out. down. Keeping it dirty in the south for the Irish. We love you, Irish fans. B Dub, you're right. We talked about the, the transfers. That is saving spring cleaning. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Because as he loses players, people forget about Bird. He's bringing in from Georgia Tech and Eli Ricks from LSU, a five star cornerback that he already has. So, yeah, I mean, he was replacing him during the season. I think he just keeps a step ahead of everybody. Right. But, you know, he's just shedding off the scraps. I think everybody's going to eat on those and, uh, we'll see how it turns out. Hopefully, we can at least call him. You know, yeah. at least do the effort to call him. God, at least. Andres Nieto, Converse, Indiana, like the shoes. That's right. That's right, Converse. You been to Converse, bro? No, nah, but I should. Shoot. <laughs> like, give us a second. We'll get to. Oh, man. Donnie Cruz from the Bronx. Gavin Wright. Austin, Texas. Johnny S. Jackson, Mississippi. That's what's up, oh, Johnny. Man. My people are from Morton. What's about up, three Johnny? miles, 20 miles east of you there, dude. That's right. Family from Morton. Haven't been there in a while, but I look forward to getting down there in a few few short days. 
Jory Gallegos, Lorenzi, Arizona. We getting it up. We getting yeah. it up. We love it. We love it, Lucky Lefty. I do. I will say this, man. I do like the fact that Chancey has 45 years of professional experience. That's right. I, I like that. Like, show us some things from the pros. Because one of the greatest things you have to be able to do in the pros is, is get off the line. Yeah, and that's the and that's the main thing. I think if anything, you want to just work on the biggest things first, and that's one hundred percent getting off the line. That's something that that's been not even Dell Alexander's problem, but but even before that. And I just think it's just the foundation of why teams defend us the way they do. They feel like they can get comfortable in third down and play us in man, and that just that just has to be not the case. And and that would be the biggest thing I would think. Uh, stuck he could work on with the guys yeah so are you ready bro can can we can we get to some nitty-gritty let's get to the nitty-gritty man right, let's get to it uh so we talked about mike elson uh we talked about the kicker we got we talked about chancey stuckley um i want to make sure i word this right it, i've become aware of the culture at notre dame was worse than what many of us could have ever be believed it was at when Brian Kelly left. That's like the best way I can say it. And, and when I talk about that, specifically I'm talking about the lack of belief from the coaching staff, some more than others, in the actual players on the roster, the guys that they recruited. And that's a huge problem for me. When the coaches on the staff look at the players they brought to the university and ask them to give their blood, sweat, and tears to them and the university, and all of a sudden, your attitude towards those athletes are, are disappointed. That's the best way I can say it, are disappointed. And what we're trying to say, we've been authentic from the moment Notre Dame lost the Fiesta Bowl. We've talked about the need to upgrade the roster at Notre Dame at various positions. And it probably take two to two recruiting cycles to build the necessary depth to take the next step. And the next step might not necessarily be winning the national title. The next step just might be being able to win a semifinal game in the college football playoff. You know, Georgia yeah. had to go through those steps. They had to lose a couple of times to finally get to where they got to. And Notre Dame, it might take the next two to three years to get to that point to ultimately get over the hump. But I'm happy that the transition happened when it did because I'm telling you the confidence from the coaching staff in the players was at an all-time Low. You would not believe some of the things that Notre Dame coaches thought about the players and the program. So with that being said, we should be ecstatic, not just with Marcus Freeman being the head coach. We should be ecstatic that we're out from under that culture because that culture existed for like two years. That's right. It, it was unfair to the players. And they fought through it. Bro, we talk off the, offline all the time. You tell me about the culture that existed with the team in 14, 15, and 16, how talented you guys were, but yet and still you guys had to overcome so much from a culture and coaching standpoint. It was like, yo, this, this is crazy. You have a talented king, team, but you still have to overcome a lack of coaching and bad culture, that's unfair. And for it to be going on and deteriorating as long as it has been, for you to have an experience like that in 15 and 16, you shared something with me that I'd like you to share. You talked about what you said coming from 15 into 16, and people didn't hear you when you said it, and they didn't take heed. Yeah, I always said that in, in 15 going to 16, the biggest difference was we were losing a lot of talent. 
to the NFL. I mean, we wasn't, we didn't have Will. We were losing Ronnie. And so we still had a lot of great talent, but they were young. So our biggest difference between 15 and 16, which I was telling everybody, was that if we don't have the right coaching and we don't coach our ass off this year instead of just rolling us out there, we're going to struggle in tight games. Now, we had the talent to be in all the games that we were. I mean, we lost eight games, and most of those seven of the eight games were all within a touchdown or less or three points or less. Yeah. So that came down to last-minute drives and all on offense. It all came down to coaching uh, situations. Now, because we had the young talent we did a lot who are in the league and who are young guys that end up going to the league as well, it needed the direction and the positioning for us to be able to still be good. I felt like we still had a really good shot of winning a 10-11 game season in 2016 provided I played because at that time I didn't think that the leadership that we had was strong enough to get us through where we needed to be. And so with me not playing that year, I just felt like we wasn't uh, strong enough as a unit to get through those tough games that we ended up losing. Like I said, we lost to Duke, Michigan State, back-to-back games. I mean, it was a rough Crazy. season, but yeah. but we were always in the game because we were super talented. I mean, we had EQ, Miles, uh, Chase, Kevin Stefferson. I mean, we had a great, great core of guys, especially up front. But mm-hmm. uh, you saw the difference between a super talented team that you – was experienced and veteran in 2015 that you really didn't have to tell Ronnie nothing. You didn't have to tell Will too much. Yeah. But when we left and you said, like, all right, you got a coach now, it was a totally different situation. So as that progresses, that was the, the, the critical point of that era was, okay, something's exposed here. I thought in 2012 it was more out, outmatched player-wise. But you can't say that about 2016 because those teams we lost to, we went in knowing we should have beat them, you know, because none of those teams finished like over 500 or something. It was some crazy stat like that. So that was the biggest difference. We went from losing on a talent standpoint to, all right, we have to coach. And so what happened next year, Coach Kelly did a great job getting coaches around uh, the players, and it was a total difference. It went back to, all right, the talent suffices with enough good enough coaching we can get back to winning 10 11 games but it's similar to right now this is a critical opportunity getting here he stands important finding a strong d-line coach is important but that offense has definitely got to take the next steps as well or it's going to be a repetitive cycle so i just want everybody to understand like you might see all of these guys with great week last week right foskey came back you know, we got heat stand, Foster came back, Love came back, Patterson came back, uh, the Adamiola twins came back. Like, you get all of these great players back, Houston Griffith, uh, DJ Brown. You're like, great, we got veterans. You get Brandon Joseph, and like, man, it's looking good. But we want you to really understand at the core of this program, it was really, really bad. The culture from a coaching standpoint and their lack of belief and the players and how that kind of and what the players were really dealing with and working through and malik just talked about his experience it's like 2021 is still here it's still here and just be thankful as a fan base that we were moved we have moved on and got out from under that cloud that gray cloud and now a new culture can be built a new foundation and we got to give this coaching staff and Marcus Freeman time to build that culture because what we saw on Monday night were two teams that had a winning culture, and it took years to build it. And I'm not saying it's going to take four or five years. That's not what I'm saying. Because my expectation- no, I think it'll happen faster because we're yeah. a top program. Yeah, it's like it's not like we're going. I mean, we just won 11 games, so it's not like yeah. we're going to go a six game season and then we got to go to seven. I only see three games that can be trouble next year. Just yeah, so we I think we're locked into a nine a nine win for sure. We're only talking about really two or three game difference. That's how close we are to a national championship. Yeah. Is that we're talking about two or three games difference. And a difference maker. 
and and, and, and some screen poppers. Like please screen, definitely need screen poppers. That t-shirt is coming. Check it out. The web will be here soon. So that screen popper t-shirt, we need you all to grab that. We need screen poppers. And on top of that, yo, you just you need some dogs. Yeah, and that's and that's gonna come through recruiting. I think having yeah. a chance in Stucky, you have a better chance of catching some big time CJ William type players with a strong D line. We can get a big, nasty, aggressive, you know, D lineman out there that can match the finesse and, and quality of a Isaiah Fowski, but Isaiah Fowski isn't a a Miles Garrett. You know? But he can still be a first rounder though. Yeah, yeah, still a first rounder, but Miles Garrett he's, he's not, he's not just, a piece like that. Yeah, he's not he's not man. We you know every game. So I think it's important that we just get more intimidating on the D line factor. Yeah. And we and I mean, because it used like you said, that Alabama and Georgia D line was the premium of what you're gonna need to get not only through the season, but to win that championship. Yeah. You need to have a D line that looks very similar, and they look very similar. Yeah, it was stars on both sides. <laughs> you know, it was Jordan Davis on one, Will Anderson on the other. I mean, they had they had the stars were out defensive line wise. If it was out, was it, if it was without the defensive line, I mean, that game looks like any other college football game. You know what I mean? I mean, it wasn't. Yeah, both I mean, both lines. Both these yeah. lines showed you they they elevated the 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 the, the intensity of the game yeah. was just so different because of that factor alone, and that's what we get maxed out at every time. The difference when we play Clemson, the intensity of their D line when they have four All Americans against a great offensive line, but we didn't have the same four All Americans on our D line. Right, and it just showed in the game. It just after a time, it was like, all right, Ian is running for his life. We don't feel confident in consistently scoring, and that was the first time I saw Alabama not confident or scoring in the red zone. It was kicking field goals. I said, is it an NFL game or something? I mean, it was really locking down both teams in the red zone, and just showed that in college football you don't see that. No, you, know, you, you don't, don't see, see it from certain teams. Look, bro, let's be real, right? Right about now, Notre Dame is not chasing Alabama. No. We're trying, dude, keep it a buck. We're trying to get to Ohio State. Like, <laughs> we're trying to get, we, and that's legitimate. We're, we're close to that. We're, we're close, close to that. that. And we're trying to get to Ohio State's level. And, and trying to get finish, one. We're just trying to snatch one. Right. And once we're we not stabilize that level, right now. once we stabilize on that level, okay, now let's take the next step. Because we've proven that we can compete and play with Georgia. Yeah. Because George is never going to have a difference maker at quarterback. No, not. yeah, we'll always we'll always compete with Georgia because so of that. George is going to play that, keep it close to the best, run the ball, and we've proven all. If that's the way you're going to play, we can we can compete with you doing that. We can, yeah, know. we. You know, it's just a matter of a good day. You know, we just have to have a good and day exactly. Because you know. if we had a quarterback, we probably beat Georgia both times. One hundred percent. If right. we had a quarterback on a level like a Bryce or Deshaun Watson or something crazy, Trevor Lawrence, yeah. So but now, as long as we got the quarterback that Georgia got, we gonna always be in tough games. But teams like Ohio State and Alabama that have the elite athletes and spread us out, that's what we have a problem with. Yeah, and so we can go toe to toe with Georgia in the way they play. And compete, yeah. but that next step of dealing with the athletes like Ohio State and like Alabama have, and and the defensive lines they have, <laughs> that's not only had the D lines, but they have the quarterbacks, the skill positions, and that's the next step. Can we get to? We know we can compete with Georgia physically, but this Georgia team was even a step above. The yeah, they D, yeah, they, yeah, but their D line was so crazy that. Yeah. You know they maxed, they grabbed, they maxed out. You know they got a ninety nine on the game NCAA. They're at ninety nine. Oh, facts, facts. So. Fact. <laughs> but I will not. When the game comes out next year, I will not ever play with Georgia. 
Yeah, no, no, no. no, no, no. Yeah, I cannot play with stats. Because that's that's literally like we people got to put this in perspective. That's one of the all time greatest Georgia teams in history. That's not no just. That's like a seventy three and, and nine Golden State team. First of all, stop, <laughs> stop. Because first of all, Georgia won. Golden State did. Okay, here we go. So that's a here bad. That's a bad comparison. Oh, here we just, go. Just take it a step back and just say the seventy two. <laughs> let's say the seventy two and ten Bulls. Just go ahead and say that. <laughs> go ahead and say the seventy two and ten Bulls. I know it might hurt you. <laughs> it's cool. It might hurt a little bit. Go <laughs> to the team that actually got the job done. Oh, they got the job done. Okay, got okay. The job done. <laughs> Absolutely, you gotta go to the team. They got the job done. Super oh, chat. That's funny. Charlie White's last belt loop. Thank you. Did you see all? See all wide receiver coach that interview said the wide receivers have talent but don't know how to play according to IB today. Chances to change that. Uh. Oh, I guess. Oh snap! I was trying yeah. to be. On yeah, the PC, you shall be PC. Oh, we're trying idea. to be PC. So, oh, Brian went ahead and released the information today. You might as well drop oh, it. I be, oh, we can get funky with it then. <laughs> we can get funky. Let me get this super chat out the way. Uh, Danner, <laughs> Danner, the Bulldog, thank you for the super chat. Do you view Derek Mason now as the front runner, or do you have any views of others at this point? From Wilkes Barrel, Pennsylvania, home of the rocket, no doubt. Thank you for tapping in. Okay, Derek Mason is at the top of the list, but actually, I would probably say Mike Tressel is probably in front of him right now. Mm. From what I'm hearing, that's if he wants to leave Cincinnati. That's if he wants to leave Cincinnati. Uh, B Hart 1074, thanks for checking in from Greenwood, Indiana. I appreciate it. Uh, Jim Leonard, I saw the comment. Jim Leonard has the cushiest job in America as a D.C. He's never leaving Wisconsin until he becomes the next head coach. Never. He's going to chill and hang on State Street with soccer moms and (laughs) just have a blast, man. So I did not know that my brother Brian Driscoll let it ride. Look, man. I, we were being PC with the information, talking about how Notre Dame coaches view that trio of Quinn, Alexander, and, and uh, Kelly. Man, let me tell you something, bro. I think the st- one of the statements made was, we don't have any star players at Notre Dame. Mm. We have a bunch of role players. Mm. Role players? Mm. I I really hope this gets back to some of the players. I really do. I think so, too. It needs to. You know the intro to No Vaseline? Here's what they (laughs) think about you. Here's what they think about you. Here's what they think about you. That's what they think about you. I'm glad y'all said it all. That's that's the way Notre Dame players should feel. Like, oh, word? I'm glad. Okay. That's the way y'all felt all last year? Cool. Yeah. A team full of role players, especially on offense. They said we are Loyola. We are Loyola offense. Man, should I keep going? You should keep going because this this is – because this has to be – there was some stuff said about the quarterback room, too. He said it. You might as well let that go, too, because we need to talk about this. And we need to address and we need to get real about Yo, what we're can't missing. throw. Said the quarterback can't, can't throw. throw. Now, 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 if he's saying that and he's there, I don't want to hear Drew Pond. I don't want to hear why is Tyler Buckner not playing because clearly – because clearly they coach and staff don't even believe in the guys they recruit. Look, man. How does that make sense? This, this How does is, that make sense? And see, this is why that's whack to me, bro. That is whack. Don't recruit these kids. And then, yo, coach harder, bro. 
you sat in this young man's living room and instructed his parents that you would take care of him and love him and instruct him. Because those are deals. The matter is, you really, this is how you feel about him? When he's giving you everything? It's not cool. We've been honest and talked about how the quarterback room in Notre Dame needs to improve. Right? I've been called a hater of Tyler Buckner. <laughs> right? People in the chat today talking about Tyler Buckner is, look, look man, there is no evidence because y'all, you know, we have a bunch of public defenders for Tyler Buckner. Boy. They are on due. Tyler Buckner must have paid a nice look. To, he, he, he paid a nice retainer. <laughs> There's a bunch of public defenders for Tyler Buckner in Notre Dame's fan base. You have seen no evidence at all. You are hoping, just like me, that he comes out and plays at an elite level against Ohio State. We had Jack Cohn throw 68 passes, the most he's ever attempted in his career. Bro. And Tyler didn't get not one snap in that game. Bro. Somebody don't believe in somebody ability. Every throw from Tyler Buckner was the same speed. Every single throw. I we told did, you that though. We did I, not told you that. One, I told you we did that. Not I told you that. One touch throw. So the nuance of playing quarterback. I've watched certain quarterbacks this year have nuanced throws and change the speed and feel for the passing game that I did not see from him. I know he didn't play in high school his senior year. I know how many years it's been. You know how many high school kids? We did four tape on four high school kids that showed us nuance as juniors in throwing the ball. Did we not? Yeah. Nico, Dante, Jackson. We interviewed on one of them. Keep coming, that on. Up. coming up. We'll, we'll, we'll let you know when that's coming. Real soon. That's that Lucky Lefty Premium, LL Nation. <laughs> Lock in. We spin it different. We spin it different. What we're telling you, man, the change in the culture that has to happen is that these kids have to feel like their coaching staff believes in them. Facts. Because the coaching staff has not believed in them. And that's not the fault of the players. Nobody's blaming Tyler Buckner for how he wasn't developed last year, what should have taken place last year, when you got coaches looking at you, feeling that way about you. That's not Tyler Buckner's fault. You brought me here. You recruited me here to treat me like that, to look at me like that, to coach me like this. And a lot of it is the coaching. Absolutely. You know, Tyler has the ability, but you're not giving him the space or the confidence to go out there and be a consistent thrower of the football. When you go into practices developing these crazy ass runs where he's hurting his hamstring, Man. while he's rehabbing, he's thinking, damn, I'm in week five of the season, ain't thrown over a hundred yards, completed more than 10 passes, and they saying I can't throw now because I can't even go out there because I got a ruptured hamstring. <laughs> So the support for the players that's saying that they aren't good and they and they aren't star players is there's is a disconnect between player and coaches. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is because the coaching has to improve in the individualistic standpoint that it can come together offensively together, all together. Buggy Lefty Podcast, man. We got one more. Matt, 2011 GT. It is nice to see most of the BK stank out of South Bend. I didn't, man, I had no clue that it was as bad as it was. Real talk. Irish Shy Town, a New Year's Six Bowl win would be nice. I also saw you say that uh, Ethiopian coffee is nice. I hear it's sweet. That's what I've heard. Yeah, I'm not a coffee fan. I've heard it's sweeter. Yeah, I've heard that. Let's see. Bronx ND fan, do you think Stucky being from Georgia will impact his ability to recruit in the South? It won't hurt. It won't hurt. Look, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it a buck. I'll keep it a buck. 
players that are juniors and seniors today, and I man, it shocked me. Players that are juniors and seniors today know who Malik Zaire is. Listen to me, LL Nation. And I'm not trying to like disrespect this dude right here. But I always think like the attention span of the younger generation, like they don't dig back into their history. That's what we hear a lot. So to be around current recruits and for them to know and feel a certain way when they're talking to Malik Zaire is like, oh, snap. Like even though it's a seven, eight year difference, it's like, yo. Yeah, that's a long time, damn. It's a long time, but they're still like excited, like, yo, what's up? And that's crazy. Like, that's crazy. But Damn, it just goes to show you, like, this dude was the Georgia State player of the year. Like, he's known. I'm sure his name still rings bells for a lot of people. More than anything, it rings bells to the coaches that either coached against him or played with him in the yeah. state of Georgia and in the South. So that's the important thing. And it's and he's already a good a good face down there in recruiting. So yeah. he's just got a different set of clothes on with a different hat. Right. So his his imprint with the kids is still there, which gives us the advantage of possibly getting them up to South Bend. I think if anybody has to convey uh, how to make it look pretty as a guy from the South going up there, yeah. he's the best to do it in that position. So that's definitely a bonus in recruiting when you come to. Think about how we can solidify our recruiting and position skill-wise, and that's a great way. And plus, I think just the relatability, you're getting the younger staff, guys that are younger but experienced. You know, Marcus played in the league. Chancey Stuckey played. James Laronitis played. Guys that are old, like OGs in the game, but not OGs in the coaching world. So right. I think that's the best way of – getting in the fastest recruits yeah, uh, of, a, of a quality of talent without necessarily having to, to hit them with the duffel. Um, so I do think this is a, a promising start for what, for what he could add to later, you know, exactly, especially when we're transitioning out of guys that have been there for 12 years. You know, that's, that's like letting go of Ben Roethlisberger. I know it's going to be a, cloud over their organization but with a guy like elston leaving i think we'll find enough youth to replace that it's a cloud but guess what they got a leader they know that's the one thing they know like okay ben might be leaving but we we got a leader and a head coach that's right, that's right. They, they know that for a fact let's see um thank you joe eli or eli or ellie Sorry about Motherfoot. Motherfoot. Tapping in. Aye, aye. Let's see. Tom A from Vatican City. Is that uh <laughs> actually Vatican City or the nickname? Because you know, I know certain parts of uh Chicago that are referred to as Vatican City too. Uh let's see. Question from ND Irish 8. Do you all think ND will entertain the thought of getting an experienced quarterback from the portal that fits their style of play if one showed up like Cone last year? You can have that. Uh, I think Cone was just a placeholder because I think anybody could have really uh, went in there and got 11 games out of there because I still can't think of the game necessarily. If you want to say Florida State, other than that, I don't really – thinking too many games where I'm like, thank God we had Jack home, you know. So he did a great job for what we asked him to do, but was he the the difference maker in our season from winning 11 games to nine games? Uh, you know, I don't know. But in terms of the transfer portal, though, I don't think anybody is better than Jack Cone that we really necessarily want. Right? I mean, have you seen anybody? I mean, obviously Caleb Williams. But if he's not of a Caleb Williams stature, look, we're trying to get one or two games better, and that's a one or two games difference. Yeah. 
uh, Grafton Williams. He said cap twice. I don't know what he was saying was cap. Whether, whether he was responding to some some responding to someone in the chat or something we said. Man, feel free to clarify. Um, <laughs> Carlos said out the screen popper shirts discounted to LL Nation subscribers. Shit, we gotta get it up there. <laughs> Uh, Jay, uh, Jay Henry, for sh for sure. We easily clipped them in Athens with an elite quarterback. Both games we had the Both ball games. and with a chance to win. Both games. Yeah, yeah. And I did. Neither time did I feel like we were gonna get the job done. But no, yeah. Neither time did I feel like oh, we about to go down there. No, 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 no. Right. Because I'm like, who is it gonna come from? Right. <laughs> hey. Michael Parks, eight one two in the house. Eight one two. Eight one two. see yeah troy mcintosh you're right just go back and look at freeman's comments about he had every reason they tried to bait him into saying any and everything about c lou after that fiesta bowl and c lou was like we're gonna get him we're gonna work with him we're gonna develop him we're gonna, he's gonna make plays for us yeah, yeah, BK definitely would have never, ever, ever. He probably would have blamed the whole game on him anyway. But I think that's the backup you need for a young guy. You know, C. Yeah. Lou was just, it was just an unfortunate situation at that time, you know, and I think him getting that boost of confidence from his head coach, Marcus Freeman, saying, we got your back, even though everybody, including Marcus Freeman, probably was like, boy, we had a, <laughs> you got to turn that around. <laughs> I think that, that'll make him confident enough to go into the offseason. And maybe surprise us in the spring. You know, if he's out there picking off Tyler Buckner all offseason, I think we have a good chance going into the season to be all right. Facts. Everybody's laughing at my soccer mom. Yeah, dude. With anybody that knows Madison, especially if you're in grad school up at UW Madison, <laughs> everybody knows about the soccer moms in Madison if you're in grad school. It's world renowned, dude. So they world got, renowned. Uh, <laughs> Leonard is probably uh, married with a family. Let me yeah. stop, man. I'm just joking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> world renowned. We just leave it at world renowned. <laughs> John Nestler said, Sean, have you had a chance to talk with Dante yet? Looking forward to your work on ID. What's good, Malik? Um, yo, stay tuned. Stay tuned. Just stay tuned. Just stay, stay, real, stay real tight. Stay Close tuned. to the best. Stay tuned. Uh, <laughs> dude, I mean, look, the only reason I went there is because, hey, you guys let me know that my brother went there on IB Nation. So I'm like, oh, it's, in, it's, it's out there now. Hey. Wait, so Tyler Buckner's a role player? Hey. They played him like a role player. I've never and seen they them. Did. They sub him in for a couple plays. Like, uh, it just it was awkward. It didn't give the fan base the confidence that he was about to ball his ball out. You know, it didn't get a fan base like he's coming in to lead us to a championship when we subbing him in like a package. <laughs> NB for life said, I'm dancing now. The petty train is warming up. Like, <laughs> dude. He's getting there. Man. He's getting there. They're putting the battery in our back. Super chat from my guy. I'm lost about who said what to who. Dale Alexander people. said it. You know, <laughs> Dale Alexander <laughs> said it. God dang it. And we need them all out the house. And it's okay. Because it's important we put his name out there because bro, it comes just, to light. Wait a minute, bro. <laughs> it comes to light to the room. It comes to light to the room. No, no, and no. we said it needs to improve. I thought we was going to keep it clatchet, dude. No, it, 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 <laughs> it shows that we need to improve. And it's going to be great that we need to improve. Because I'm telling you what, this hire, this hire with Chancey Stuckey is the improvement that we're looking for. It's, it's really the improvement that we're looking for. The words 
of Malik Zaire are his and his alone. <laughs> <laughs> I thought we already put it. It was already put out there. What are we talking about? Yo, man, I, you know, I wasn't trying to air cats out like that, man. You know. No, I thought it was already put out there. What are we talking about? Uh, no, he said coaches. I'm not sure if he said an actual name. Uh, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so. Yo, I, I thought he was. Uh, I don't know what I don't know what Malik is talking about right now. <laughs> I thought you said it was air. <laughs> no, people just mentioned that he brought up things that were said by coaches in Damn. general. That's all I'm saying. Man. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. <laughs> uh, my bad, dog. I thought, I thought they were in the chat saying, yeah, we got to bring it up. So, I'm not totally sure if it was that individual, but I'm just saying they happen to be somewhere around. <laughs> like I said, the trio of coaches that felt that way and gave that vibe. I told you the trio of coaches earlier. The head guy, the old line guy, and heck, Malika <laughs> already let it ride with the other guy. So, listen, is it, I think it's just I think it's a consensus. We all felt that the glaring positions on our team needed to be addressed. Everybody in the room, everybody in the room. You know what I mean? And I think it's important that. If anything, we we look at this from a perspective of is this the turning point where we're cleaning house in the right places? You know, what I mean, I think if anything, we've made a lot of changes through the years, but are we making? <laughs> no, man. <laughs> My man, you know, people got families, man. People got families, bro. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all sit on the chat. See, I got to catch the whole IB breakdown next time, man. I thought he had already put information out there. Oh, <laughs> hey, Mac. Hey, Mac. I need you to get your boy, man. <laughs> Get your boy lucky, man. Get your boy lucky. Get See the caps on, so you know. We got a real room. question here. MW Junior seventy two says, "Real talk, do we think Rees is the answer at quarterback coach?" I think he's got the potential. You know, I played with Tommy, so I know how he literally thinks a little bit. I think, if anything, uh, Tommy has the great ability of being creative. I think we saw that from how he. Coach early in the playoff games and his just ability to and what he did with Ian, I think his last two seasons on just a mature level and being able to manage the game. I think it's just important moving forward that now he gets a whole fresh start. You know, he gets a fresh start to a, <laughs> he's a whole fresh start to this offense. And I just think it's just the best thing moving forward. <laughs> Oh Lord, man! Royal fingers, what are you doing? <laughs> All of the pods. <laughs> coaches talking crazy about players. Malik, it was Dale. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's terrible. <laughs> oh, Anthony Silas, only on the LL podcast when you get coaches' name dropped in a public forum. Thanks for the honesty. Uh, good grief. Uh, well, we'll probably get a lot of players to come on the show. I don't know if a lot of coaches are going to come on. The show. Oh, man. I thought they put it out there. Good grief. <laughs> well, we do spend it different, man. You know, I think if anything, it wasn't like uh, it was just an opinion, you know, you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> my man said tonight's <laughs> broadcast is really brought to you by. More whiskey with all this tea dropping. 
Hey. Yo, man. <laughs> we man, we keep it authentic. We keep it a thou. And like, yo, it shocked us hearing certain things and saying, yo, it, it was worse than what we thought. Like if that's if that's what's taking place. Yo, as a player, how do you how do you go out every week and overcome that? Like, man. I think the good thing is though, we got Marcus Freeman, man. I think his his energy and his focus on what needs to be done each day has been instilled into the team. I mean, if we just play the JD Bertrand clip about how they prepare for the game, I think that's just should be the focus moving in the spring. And that competitive nature though is really going to grow within that team where they're going to be a, a team that's going to be hard from the outside to penetrate what they're building on the inside, in my opinion. T-Dub, no doubt. No doubt. <laughs> it ain't had a banana. I don't like that. Drop the dime on these cats. I don't like that. Mm -mm. I don't like that. That's He is big head of Rico, for sure. For sure. Magic man walking up to him. I think Dolos, the state, the state, run. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh my God, dude. <laughs> and you know, as an as a LL Nation, you can keep it transparent because, you know. Got to drop the dime on them. If, if we don't get to a championship, I feel like you got to be, you know, straight up on what our faults are and our weaknesses. And address them, whether they feel like it or not, whatever the case may be, that position needs help, just like many other positions. And we one step closer with the MF air. <laughs> oh, man. Sorry, Malik. Didn't mean to get you on the petty train. <laughs> the names were mentioned in the chat and I missed it. Oh, man. You, you got a bunch of fans tonight, bro. <laughs> We're loving you tonight. Yeah, it's like, thank you. <laughs> Troy, back in time, says, yeah, he just bum rushed me in the middle of my seat. <laughs> Man, just say it. Just say it was damn. <laughs> what? Like, what? Man, I thought it was already, you said it was already reported. So I'm thinking like, oh, okay, he probably already said it. And I was just, man, I was disappointed, man, that we uh that we really was missing that, you know. Hey Henry said you went straight Nino you know, Brown in the courtroom, bro. That's not fair, man. Oh my god, <laughs> man. Yeah, and I, I know I talked to Brian. He did say that uh candidates for the wide receiver candidates. The wide receiver candidates, when they were being interviewed, were saying that Notre Dame had a ton of talent at wide receiver, but just from a technique standpoint, they just didn't know what they were doing. And but you know, there's just a fine line. It's just a fine line, man. When you're getting the the people that you're getting and fitting it within the offense that you're trying to run, you know. Mm -hmm. So there's certain. Things that I know, you know, as Tommy is offensive coordinator, I feel like each game he's being specific to uh, each defense that he's going against. So these plays are designed a certain way each week that changes maybe the steps on the route or maybe changes the look on different things. So for a receiver to not have a full skill set, maybe coming into school, you know, a lot of these kids are raw coming into school, but maybe – adjusting week to week is a challenge when you're not able to really get that same attention to detail during the spring. You know, the spring's very general, but when you're getting to game week, you know, you're running at 100 miles an hour, adding different things. And so that can, you know, over the course of time, hard or be dampened on the receiver's ability because you, you're you not practicing those same techniques each week, you know, so it could change for them. But it's just – it just doesn't match up, you know, when you have super talented guys that are getting drafted, you know, with the four three speed, the 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 forty inch vertical. I mean, Miles had one of the best combines in recent, you know, combine history. And nobody was 
Nobody knew that, you know, for no, I knew he had a four four speed. So fitting those type of guys in Tommy's offense, I think we'll see more of guys start to flash like Styles. I liked how he used him early. Uh, we just got to get him a, a trigger man that's consistently going to do it, and I think that uh, it's going to come under Marcus Freeman. <laughs> Lucky Lefty Podcast. <laughs> My hat is broken off. <laughs> like, um, oh, man. Oh, boy. Yo, we wanted to do this show. We missed you guys this morning, and we knew some more news will be breaking, breaking later on in the day. That's why I tweeted out, like, you know, we're going to push it back to this evening. We anticipated the Elston news and possibly some other news today. So, man, my brother just <laughs> ran through the stop sign, and it's all good, man. You know what time it is. Very <laughs> good. Very good. It's time to get petty. Oh, we did a good job executing. Are you upset with something? And fire up the Petticoat Junction train. I just don't like you. You don't? No. What is today's petty historic Petty Junction? Right, Petty Junction, each and every show right here, Lucky Lucky Podcast. We spin it different. I got somebody on the Petty. Since, since you didn't drop the dime on them, we definitely putting them on the Petty Train. <laughs> it, it, yo, he might be on the Petty Train for like the next week. Oh my goodness. See, role players, got, Sam? Got... We got a roster full of role players? I don't think so. I think we use them like role players. You know, we use them like role players. Yeah, man. You might have to put them on a petty train. <laughs> but you know, the thing is, though, it's not that I'm saying something that he probably didn't really feel. You know what I mean? Allegedly. So it's like, I think in the, in the heat of the moment, just like in a game, many things happen. I think if anything, he's going to bounce back and will bounce back. Shoot. But also, I do have a petty nomination. Go ahead, because I got one, too, that I meant to say the other day, but I, I held it off. Go ahead. I'm definitely giving the petty change to the NFL. In the midst of declining black coaches, they continue to fire <laughs> more of them. And firing David uh, Cullen was there. David Cullen from the Houston David, Texans. David Cullen, what, what you? What did you hire him for? I mean, they hired him for a sip of coffee. He was he was there for less than a full season. It feel like knowing that the team was abysmal, knowing that you didn't have your star quarterback, hired him because thinking that he'd get Deshaun Watson back on the field or back on the team. It just it's just real. It's real petty because now. You got Mike Tomlin in year 16 hanging on for dear life. It doesn't look like y'all hiring a brother anytime soon. And we still talk about it all the time on social media. So in my opinion, you know, as tough it as it is, I think somebody's got to make a change somewhere in there. Or it's just going to continue to look pettier and pettier. Hopefully, when Mike Tomlin's done, we just get a huge statue of him. <laughs> but make a Mike Tomlin day. <laughs> that brother been a long survivor in, uh, so, in the coaching shuffle at NFL. So, whoever, whomever on the Georgia staff from the other night grabbed the wrong box in the back and was <laughs> passing out Alabama National Championship hats to the Georgia team, man. You got guys on the field getting interviewed with National Champ with the Alabama logo right there on the hat you gotta throw you on the petty train man you had one task grab the right box that's it they probably you already shipped they already hat. shipped the other box yeah the other shipped the other box to third man. world country they didn't know they was going in <laughs> and your boy k we gotta do k bond tipper though 
<laughs> Your boy Kayvon Thibodeau sat down with Joe Clatt, man. Talked about the business of choosing Oregon over Alabama. He didn't have to spit on the Alabama to be like that, bro. P Dub brought it up. It's like, come on, man. Like, See, he's not a Notre Dame guy. <laughs> who? Thibodeau? Yeah, we wouldn't have got Thibodeau. <laughs> Dude, Tib say, yo, I'm guaranteed a job with Nike, fam. <laughs> guaranteed. Now, I don't know what that Alabama degree is going to get you. But I'm guaranteed a job with Nike. Hey, that's the business that's of it right there. Say, Bill Knight, that's on me. Man, that's in my Rolodex, you hear me? Yeah. That's in my favorites. Top five, T-Mo. Yeah, I got a question, dude. Well, if you had to hook up, and let's not get super deep in the chat. I understand some of you guys don't like Nat Nike for several reasons. I get it. But I'm talking to my brother and some of you that want to answer the question. If you had to hook up a Nike, give me the three pairs of shoes that you would want sent to you right now. I'm an Air Max guy. Really? Air Max 95s. Probably get a pair of those. I like the dunks. I like the dunks. The dunks have been growing on me, so I get a pair of dunks. And then I'll probably get some ones. Some Air Force ones? Yes, yeah, the Air Force ones. Okay. Because that's the original. It's a nice classic brick white. Can't go wrong, man. I probably would get... Honestly, I probably would go all bread. I would go Air Jordan 1. I would go 1s. The breads. The black toe. Mm. Um, then they have a Carolina blue in the threes. I think those bad fellas are going for like 10 stacks if you can find them. 10 stacks? Yeah, dude. The shoe game really expensive, man, nowadays. I love and dunks, then though, I will get the original red Yeezys. The, the, those bad fellas are exclusive. Too. Those are hard. Oh, the red Octobers? The red Octobers, boy. Yeah, I was going to say that, too, because I, I I wear Yeezy the majority of the time now. Yeah. Man, I, yeah, bought my wife, I bought my wife a pair of Yeezy slides for Christmas. The orange ones? What color? No, I think they're like a uh, like a brown tannish. Yeah, them are smooth. Yeah, those are smooth. She, she swears by them bad fellas. <laughs> she like them. She, she like man. The car goes on. Donnie Cruz said uh, the first LeBrons, the bread Elevens, and the black. Yeah, the the pos Yeah, the posits are dope. I agree with that. I don't really like the posits that much. You don't rock with the posits like that. It looks big. I got Michael Jenkins at the Concord 11s and the Bread 4s. Jay Henry said the OG Jordan 1s, Off White Carolinas, and Dior Jordan. Dior Jordan. Jordan. I like the Dior White. Jordan. Uh, Weezing the Juice. The True Bands, not the Age of One, the Skunk Dunks, and the Bread 11. The Skunk Dunks are fire too. Mm -hmm. Juan Lozado said dunks are dope. I like dunks. I like the you like the high top or the low top dunks. I like the low tops. I rock low the top. low tops too. That's like the little swag these days. Yeah, the, low top the uh the black and white joints they brought out this year was fire. They look smooth and look like they go with anything, you know. Right, right. Whether you know you can dress them up or dress them down. And Anthony Solomon said he has a pair of white shorts with the gold trim. 
Alright. Oh. Come on. Another hot man. episode. Y'all talking about some sketches. I think I got all of the uh I never had a pair of Iversons, dude. Never wanted a pair. Yeah, not the Reeboks, no thanks. Uh, let's see. Brian Kine with a nice list. Jordan 11 adapt and Griffey, the Griffey ones. The Griffey ones are dope. They just reissued them. I like the Griffey's. I, I have a pair of Griffey's. And, um, you had them back in the day? Yeah, they had a, um, they had like a, a sale on them at this place in Arizona. And I copped them. Royal Finger said uh, the 92 Air Max. Now, if I'm the doing ACG like, boots? Good grief. If I'm doing Air Max, they got to be the Air Max 1s. I'm just, dude, the Air Max 1s, I'm good. Really? Yeah, I, I really didn't. I didn't like the 95s, I didn't like. Really? I like you know, the 95s. Nah, I'm just an Air Max 1 dude. The AC, ACG boots were nice and the number four Jordans. The Yeezy boots is what I like now. I don't like the ACG. I like the easy boots. Oh, you go back. Okay, P Dub with the Kevin Johnsons. The Kevin Johnsons were fly. So man, how you think we should do it again tomorrow morning, bro? What you think? What's the fans think? What's the LL Nation think? Hey. Tomorrow morning. Let's we get it. it. Nine o'clock. We're back, man answering all your questions it's your show tomorrow ll nation come prepared we'll have some good talk ready for you some great content thank you so much don't forget subscribe share like subscribe share like hit the like button hit the like button and we'll talk to you guys tomorrow morning for another episode lucky lefty podcast for my guy malik zaire i am sean davis at sd2 mics we bid you adieu Sleep good, get some rest, spend it different. Yep.